Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Now available on Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. O'Reilly Auto Parts specializes in keeping your car on the road. Superstart batteries exclusively at O'Reilly Auto Parts are designed to meet the electrical demands of today's vehicles. Get dependable power and performance from a Superstart battery for your car, truck, motorcycle, lawnmower, boat, and more. Superstart batteries are built to handle even the toughest conditions. Not sure how much life is left in your battery? O'Reilly Auto Parts can help. Their professional parts people will test your battery for free. If it does need to be replaced, they'll help you find just the right battery to fit your car. Visit O'Reilly Auto Parts today, and their professional parts people can test your battery or help you find the best Superstart battery for your vehicle. Stop by O'Reilly Auto Parts or visit O'ReillyAuto.com because I said so. GEICO has the insurance industry-leading app that lets you manage your policy anytime, anywhere, which means that GEICO is always there for you, if only everyone was always there for you. Like animal control, when you're cornered in your garage by an angry possum. Hi, me again. Uh, You guys said you would be here about an hour ago, and um, I think the possum is starting to get angry. uh, Listen, I thought if I fed it, it would go away, but now it is ripping holes in the drywall and making some sort of nest. Just call me back. (laughs) Geico, always there for you with savings and the industry-leading mobile app. The Steve Austin Show is brought to you free today by our friends at BetOnline. Get in the mix at BetOnline.ag and use the promo code PODCAST1 for your 50% welcome bonus. BetOnline, your online sportsbook experts and exclusive partner of Podcast One Sportsnet. The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. Here we go. I'm sitting here talking to one of my favorite pro wrestlers of all time, Ivan Koloff, who's down there in North Carolina. I'm over here in Los Angeles, California. Had to come back and take care of some business. Ivan, you're one of my all-time favorites. I used to love you guys raising hell and doing your thing and beating everybody up, especially back in the NWA days. It's good to talk to you. How are you doing these days? Great, yeah. yeah just a few uh, maybe uh, results of uh, 50 years of uh, being in the ring and uh, part of the wrestling business, but uh, uh, I, I feel fortunate uh, to be even here, you know, with uh, all the crazy stuff I ended up uh, doing uh, during my career, and uh, I guess for that reason alone, uh, matter of fact, considering uh, the years of wrestling and the, the crazy bumps off the top rope and everything, <laughs> landing uh, on tables and chairs, uh, well, like a lot of crazy stuff they're doing today, you know, uh, Steve, uh, but you really appreciate you got to get hurt, you know, at times. And I know ankles, knees, back, shoulders over the years. But back in our time, we weren't able to take a lot of time off and heal up, you know. It, uh, I was told at one time that if I took time off, uh, I'd have to uh, figure on uh, figure on replacing me. Put yourself in, the, in that place. But, uh, well, what was, that was the thing about the business, though, Ivan. I mean, you could never take yourself off the road or take yourself out of a storyline because if you just told a promoter, hey, man, I'm kind of tired or I'm a little bit broke down, you're not going to make any money. And, you know, these okay. days on a guaranteed contract, you know, guys are, you know, they'll still get paid. But back in my day, when I, when I was off for about a year with my neck fusion, you know, I didn't get any pay during that entire year. So you know the system because you were around from way back in the day. Uh, with that yeah. being said, you know, when you first started dropping that knee off the top rope, did you think, you know, I guess, well, none of us ever think, hey, this is going to catch up with me down the road? Because I, I would imagine uh, you're at about, what, 72 now? 72, yep. Yeah. Dropping that knee all those years it has to. It's gonna. It's gonna take a toll on your body. Uh, how many surgeries have you had? What is your? Where are you at right now on a physical level? Well, as far as uh, surgeries, I haven't had many. Just like we we're talking about the idea of being replaced. If you, you know, had to take time off like that, so I just didn't take the time off. I had one shoulder, the right shoulder surgery on it. Because I ended up uh, hitting the post down in Florida about a year before that, uh, wrestling Dusty, the Dusty Rhodes, and uh, hit it pretty hard. And uh, it turned, you know, black and blue type thing, and uh, let it go, and it healed up to something I thought all right. But uh, found out about a year later that spurs had developed in there, and they had to go in because I couldn't lift it. I couldn't lift it over my head anymore, my arm. It was really a lot of pain, so they went in and, uh, cut it open, and I guess they cleaned the spurs out and 
I know my shoulder's about a half inch or an inch shorter now than the other one, but uh, it took care of the business, uh, you know, as far as the injury for, uh, you know, maybe 50 years or so, and then it started acting up again, and I'm back to where I started from now. I can, I exercise it a lot, you know, try to keep it going, but uh, as far as this is on my head, I restricted and behind my back on that right arm. The left arm, my shoulder's been torn, the uh, rotary cuff, and uh, never got it fixed. The bicep broke, tricep broke. Uh, so uh, that's, <laughs> both shoulders need to work now. Well, you've got some herniated disc in your back as well. Uh, yeah, my back has been uh, diagnosed with severe lumbar stenosis, which uh, doctor says you need plates and screws and all that stuff. And uh, But I've known some people went in and got that subject staff and all that, so uh, I had other people tell me, uh, wait as long as you can. Matter of fact, even Bruno told me that uh, you'll know when it's time to go in. He says, whenever you uh, uh, go for a walk and your legs give out and you fall down, I guess that happened to him and he had to go in and get the surgery to his back. So right so far, I'm not falling down, so I figured I'll just keep going. I, I don't know how old you got to be to be old, but... <laughs> I uh, figured that I'll uh, wait as long as I can. But my left ankle's been broke uh, four times. I got big spurs on that from coming off the top row. And I think that's what it is. You break little bones landing wrong. I even came off the top and landed on the floor outside. And uh, I see these guys today doing that, and I said, oh, man, don't do that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but you were uh, doing it way back in the day. Hey, yeah. Ivan. You know, you started off your career. You know, you're 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 from Canada, and then you you ultimately achieved the the, uh, the Russian gimmick, the Ivan Koloff gimmick, and it was yeah. uh, golly, it was one of the Rouge one of the Rougeaus that uh, came up with that idea. But you, my point is, you've wrestled as a single, you've wrestled as a tag team uh, for mm-hmm. so long, and you had a, a tremendous run. Uh, well, I thought in, in WWF, you know, when you beat. Bruno San Martino for the World Heavyweight title. I want to cover that in a minute. And then lost that title to Pedro Morales. But then, you know, later on down the road, you found yourself down in the Crockett territories. And and that's where I remember, you know, your career so vividly. And, of course, then you teaming up with Nikita Koloff. And you were a very, very uh, good tag team wrestler, but you were equally as good as a singles. What did you prefer? You know, really, uh, it didn't seem like it mattered to me. I, I liked both, uh, the re- and I ended up uh, in tag having a lot of partners from the time of uh, Minnesota. Yep. He me up with the superstar Billy Graham. Florida I was tag team with him and New York, uh, superstar Billy Graham. And I had the belts down here in the NWA with Ray Stevens and uh, Crusher and Nikita different occasions and Don Canoodle. Yeah, but how was and, tagging uh, up how was tagging up with, with superstar Billy Graham? Because you guys were two completely different workers. Billy was more mm-hmm. of a showman and you were more of a wrestler, you know, serious wrestler. And and, and superstar is one of my favorites of all time, so I don't mean that as a disrespect mm-hmm. to him, but how did you guys yeah. gel as a tag team? Uh, we got along real good. Uh, I guess I just uh, really respected and loved uh, Billy for you know, we ended up working out together in the weights, and he showed me a lot of stuff because he was bodybuilder, and uh, of course, I was just trying to get big, and uh, the idea of uh, cutting up and all that, I never got involved in that or steroids, thank God, but uh, you know, he showed me a lot of stuff that really helped me as far as working out, and in the ring, even if it's to this day, he said, uh, Ivan was a workhorse. Uh, I ended up choking and <laughs> doing my stuff, but uh, Ivan would come in and bump all over the place, and but uh, and that's what makes a team. Like a lot of times, it uh, it takes uh, either both guys do it, or and Billy was ideal because he had that body and he could pose and and then play the chicken thing and run. And, yeah, uh, but you were never, but you were never a chicken type heel. I mean, you, so uh, okay. hey, you brought up you brought up the steroids. Now, how early on back in the day did the steroids really become prevalent? You know, I was trying to figure that out one day and. I know it was far back because I got my back hurt the first time in 73 when I was in Minnesota. They landed on a board that was out of place in a match, a superstar and myself against Wahoo and uh, Billy Robinson and ended up uh, really hurt the bat. And uh, they ended up, uh, I took about a, two months off and it came back. And uh, But I was ambulatory tracks and chiropractor and all that stuff. And uh, it came back, but I uh, ended up really hurting it at that time and uh that, that slowed me down quite a bit as far as uh 
being able to perform. And I realized it. And then after that, I came into the Charlotte area, and I was fortunate enough to heal up enough, I guess, to... Uh, and Superstar had introduced me. He even said, Ivan, for that back, if you take uh, some of the steroids, what it's meant to do is help heal, you know, because the guys come back from the war and all that, they, uh, they're anemic and all that. They, they give them certain ones to, I guess, uh, get the body going again. Right. And I said, uh, well, I don't know, maybe I could try a little bit. But I just found my... Uh, I'd already been on prednisone for about 10 years because of a diagnosis of a situation that I had in my body. Of uh, They misdiagnosed me with uh, TB way back in 73. Wow. And it turned out it was sarcoidosis, which they don't even sure to this day what it was, but the prednisone, taking that 5 milligram a day for 10 years, it went away. And uh, consequently, uh, I ended up... Uh, Tell him about Graham Matt, and I said, uh, man, what I need to do is uh, maybe try it. I tried it, and uh, it was no good, because this was before I even was on the prednisone, and uh, I found that I, all of a sudden I was hung, more hungry, and uh, I was retaining fluid and all that, so I was like, yes. I take that. Yeah. And he even offered the shots, you know, but I uh, I didn't go that route. Thank God I did, because I probably have other issues there now, but... Uh, I think that was my first introduction. As far as other guys used, I know as far back as uh, the 70s, I was uh, in California for a while with Billy and uh, Dave Draper and Arnold, uh, uh, you know, Schwarzenegger. Bet uh, them, and you know, I got obviously do that they're taking some stuff, but I didn't right. know what because you, you don't look like that unless you end up taking something, I guess. But uh, I ended up uh, staying away from it, and I'm glad I did. But, but did you uh, spend a lot, lot of time of in the gym, Ivan? Yeah, I did. I ended up uh, at first doing heavy weights and trying to bulk up. Once I bulked up, I stayed pretty well on that routine of uh, heavy lifting. I noticed in the early 80s, I see a lot of uh, guys seem like they're speeding up on TV and more right. action and all that. And I figured I lost the weight, so I started running in that, and... Uh, I, I used to run about three miles a day. You know, that kept my weight down. and got my weight down, and I felt so good. I said, man, i got to keep doing this. But then after the uh, a lot of injuries started a- happening, it, uh, but for a good 10 years, there, I felt uh, great, you know, that uh, I kept the weight down by running. Ivan, you wrote your book, Is That Wrestling Fake? The Bare Facts. And, uh, you know, you were basically in the business five, six years. It was your second stint with uh, WWWF. All of a sudden, you find out you're going to beat Bruno San Martino for the World Heavyweight title in Madison Square Garden. Who, you know, told you, Ivan, this is what we're going to do, and, you know, ran the angle by you? Uh, That's it. I ended up, first of all, getting contacted. I was in Hawaii coming back from Australia on a tour, and I had already wrestled Bruno and all that. And uh, they, uh, I got a call one day. I was at the gym there, and I got a call. And uh, it was Pedro, and uh, I had really known Pedro at well or anything like that. I knew about him, but uh, he said that, hey, Ivan, I, I, I got to meet with you. I'm on my way over here to uh, Hawaii, and uh, I want to uh, get with you. And he says, uh, Vince is sending me. Uh, he wanted me to talk to you, and uh, that was the first introduction. I didn't know what it was all about. He just wanted me to call Vince and uh, he said it would be something that was good. And uh, and you're talking about Vince out. McMahon Sr. Yeah. Yeah. Senior. And I got on the phone with him, and uh, he told me, he said, let you come back. And, uh, the idea was to come back for at least a year, like, you know, type of thing. And, now, uh, they picked you yeah. to take the title off Bruno, Ivan. Who else could they have chosen back then? Who, who other than yourself, was hot or a viable heel that they could have possibly put that belt on other than you? Man, uh, for myself, uh, I was pitching myself because I kind of figured, man, what a, a lucky guy to get uh, picked for this, you know, to get the, the switch of the belt from Bruno, because Bruno was my, my hero type thing. And uh, to this day, he was still uh, keeping touch with me. I really respected him over the years. And, uh, and I really uh, thought that I was surprised, really surprised. And uh, as far as. Who were the I, other I, hot heels, yeah. though? Man, I, I right now I think, but uh, I know there was a lot of guys out there that even later on they ended up uh, switching with uh, Stan Stasiak, right? 
he was out there, for right. example, but all the other guys, like, uh, I mean, from uh, Pedro right down to the, the superstar Billy Grant, the Ray Stevens, and uh, all those guys. I mean, the, the Black Jacks, and uh, I mean, you, you stop and think of it, you look at all the talent that's out there, let alone that was in the WWF at one time or another, but in other territories, you know, was great talent. And uh, I guess uh, the idea of the Russian and uh, the way it was with uh, the news and all this stuff that they figured there'd be a lot of uh, interest in that. And uh, I just struck them at the right time, I suppose. And, but you guys uh, had good chemistry in the ring, and it looked like you guys enjoyed working with each other and, and, and almost similar styles. Yeah. Got along real good with uh, Bruno, I think, because I respected him so much. And <laughs> all the years when I was in there, and, uh, Bruno, of course, uh, was all business and uh, ended up, I, I think, maybe the size and everything had a lot to do with it. Because uh, I remember that night I weighed in, I was 305, and where Bruno was like uh, 280, uh, 280 or something. And I said, damn, I'm bigger than Bruno, <laughs> you know, type of thing. But uh, I was really excited about it. I didn't look at it that way. And, it was just uh, that I was really pleased, happy to. I watched as much as that match as I could find on uh, YouTube, and I was yeah. surprised at the amount of high spots that you guys were using, uh, uh -huh. especially considering the, the year that that match happened. And in the book, you talk about a double cross uh, happens from the New York wrestling office after you won the title. What was the double cross? Well, as far as uh, not actually a double cross, uh, I think that that was uh, the uh, when I went to the uh, Charlotte area, the NWA, and then the IWA came in there, uh, which was a competition to the Crockett and I guess to everybody. Because at that time, it looked like they were just coming in to the, the Carolinas, and they, they, they approached me uh, a few months after I got in the Carolinas, and they were treating me fine. It was just, they said, uh, we We'll give you double the money, and uh, I figured wrestling was more like, uh, you know, like a drugstore, two or three drugstores in the same block. Because I'm, you know, just, you know, you're just a freelance uh, contractor, and so I just. Uh, so it's more of a thing of being blackballed just because you jump promotions. I, I think so. Yeah, in a sense, you know, that that's what it was. But I, I didn't ever blame Vince or any of them. They did. Uh, they just did what they thought, and they really wanted me to come back to the to them and I was actually supposed to. Uh, I was supposed to double cross the uh, IWA at that show in New Jersey and uh, leave them and come over to Vince uh, that night and I just couldn't do it. I looked at the in the dressing room and the boys were, you know, under contract there and I figured I'm one of the, the guys that they're depending on here. If I leave and this thing pulls then uh, you know uh, I, I'm to blame for Guys being out of the job, as I said. Right. So I did. I did go. With, probably it was a mistake, and I should have probably went for Vince. Because he always treated me good. And even after that, treated me good. It's just the uh, idea that uh, I felt bad uh, about the boys, and I, I never uh, went for it. I went ahead with the show, and consequently, they ended up uh, negotiating with me at that time. Because when I first went with the IWA, there was a six-month contract with. Uh, the idea of a year after that, and their negotiation been at that time with me, and I understood that they were going to go for a year, and at least the same money, if not more, and uh, they ended up, uh, I guess, finding out about it, or I don't know. They just ended up sending me a telegram in a way that that was it. Uh, uh, they were going to let me go. So then I found myself now without work with them, and uh, everybody else mad at me. <laughs> so you can imagine, here you are trying to get uh, book. And I even went to Tennessee for a week there, right around that time, and then uh, Roger finally used me, and uh, then they started using me down in Florida, and, uh, St. Louis, and all that. But uh, for a while, it looked like uh, <laughs> I got everybody mad at me for a while, but it wasn't an intentional thing. I was just, I guess, out of... Uh, yeah, yeah, just out there trying to make a buck. Market. Hey, let me ask you yeah. a question. Going back to the championship match in Madison Square Garden against Bruno, uh, you win clean. You're finished. Knee drop off the top. Uh, he shot you into the turnbuckle charge. You stuck up a foot and then get up top, drop the knee on him. One, two, three. The referee raises your hand. It looks like he's telling you to get out of the ring. 
and there was some there was some uh, voiceover work that was put on top of the match, at, uh, seemingly at a later date. They were talking about, oh, we've got to get this guy out of here. There's too much heat. To me, it looked like there was shock. It was a very quiet arena. I didn't feel the heat because it wasn't a screw job finish. You beat the man fair and square right in the middle of the ring. Why did they present you with the belt inside the ring and give you your moment right then? I really think it was because they felt that there was – the people were too quiet. And I had felt the same thing before in Montreal and uh, being hot, uh, Ernie and the Cat Lab were in a tag against the Rougeos and they filled the ring up with chairs and it went real quiet like that and then they start throwing the chairs. So I, I picked up on it whenever the referee said, Don't, uh, give, I'll give it to you back in the dressing room. So I just did what they told me and, and left and figures that that's what they're concerned about. That the people were not going to accept that they're going to get <laughs> had because we were lost. It was one of those things. I just figured that, uh, you know, the quality of the tape that you see there now that the people have seen on that match was just somebody I understand in the audience has filmed it. Yes. It wasn't being filmed, yeah, by the, the officer or anything. So back then they didn't film everything. This is the Steve Austin Show. If you're a business owner, you don't need us to tell you that running a business is tough. But you might be making it harder on yourself than necessary. Don't let QuickBooks and spreadsheets slow you down anymore. It's time to upgrade to NetSuite. Stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information you need when you need it. Ditch the spreadsheets and all the old software you've outgrown. Now is the time to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more. Everything you need, all in one place, instantaneously. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in revenue, save time and money with NetSuite. Join the over 22,000 companies using NetSuite right now. Let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour at NetSuite.com Steve. Schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash steve. netsuite.com slash steve. Hey, what was the difference between working with a guy like Vince McMahon Sr. and uh, the, 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 the guys that were running Crockett Promotions? What was the difference between those two promotions just as far as the way they operated? Well, what I found that uh, with uh, – Vince up there, he was the man that you went and talked to, senior. And I appreciated that fact because you felt like you were going to get somewhere when you ended up talking to some, the office, you know, you had the situation, whatever it was, uh, maybe a suggestion or if you just had uh, a beef or whatever, you just went right to Vince Senior and you seen him every three weeks whenever we did the TV taping uh, in Allentown or Reading or whatever, Hamburg or whatever it was at. And uh, they ended up... Uh, you would be able to pull Vince aside and talk to him, you know, just tell him and uh, uh, how you found or what uh, you had wrong or whatever you want to suggest or whatever like that. And to me, that made it a lot easier for me than uh, a place like uh, the NWA with the different territories. And you came in, you had the promoter, Jim Crockett, then you had a booker, George South or Dusty or whoever it was. You uh, at, In a situation like that, you went and talked to the Booker rather than the promoter, and uh, that was the guy that was in charge. It, it seemed like it. ultimately, I guess, Crockett would uh, override them if there was something he didn't like, if he knew about it, but uh, they seemed like they had the rain when they were in there. And that made it a lot uh, more feeling of security, I guess, whenever you're talking directly to the, the boss, that thing, or the owner. But uh, I always got along good with. Uh, with the ball, as far as that goes, uh, until I did something like that IWA thing there, <laughs> and of course, they, after that, they're all right with it. They ended up having to come back. So, but Ivan, what was your too. thoughts when you know Vince Jr. bought the territory from his dad, and you know, this, mm-hmm. of course, you know Vince started off as Capital Wrestling Corporation or whatever it was in D.C. and moved to. Uh, Stanford, Connecticut, and the New York office is what it was always referred to. You're working down the Crockett's uh, IWA. 
uh, AWA. I mean, you're all over the place. You're where down in Florida. What was what were you thinking when Vince McMahon took over and started putting all the different territories out of the, out of business? All of the different places were drying up as options for you to go as a wrestler. Uh, did that concern you? Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, 10, 15, well, 15 years ago, it was the Monday Night Wars. It was WCW, which was NWA, versus WWE. And so those were the only two places to go. And now there's only really one place to go, and that's WWE. But what were your thoughts when, when Vince started taking his guys into other territories I know he rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Vince has told me himself that he received a lot of death threats. You as a wrestler, your options of places to go are drying up. What were your thoughts on that? Uh, actually, I did end up leaving it all together. And I didn't, uh, I knew that Vince was going to, uh, or I heard that he was going to be buying out some of the territory, but I was still wrestling for the profits. This is in the fall of 89. And, uh, they had changed bookers, I remember, and they ended up, George Scott came back in, and he ended up uh, not having plans at the time. And uh, when I heard that, because already they were telling me, you have to drive to Atlanta to get your flight to go uh, to Chicago or to Los Angeles. I guess they're trying to encourage the guys to move to Atlanta, right. everybody. And that, there was no way I was going to do it. I had my home here and all that, so... Uh, I left. Uh, actually, I didn't leave with a notice or anything. I just left. I probably should have called Vince at that time, <laughs> you know, to see if I could be any help up there. But I guess I was at the point that I was just disgusted with the whole thing because, you know, I just went through a run with uh, Nikita and the whole thing. And I even after that stayed, did a thing with the Russian assassins and everything was fine. And, and then all of a sudden, George Scott comes in and they're moving to all of Atlanta. I, I just quit. That day I just quit. I just, when I heard that, he was coming in and that, I just uh, went home and stayed home. Like I said, I should have called Vince and seen if I could be any use up there, but uh, at that time, I guess I had been running around, like you're saying, flying to different territories from Florida to, you know, because the Crockett's were trying to do go all over, just like Vince is just doing today, but uh, it did work out for a while there. I guess he was competing with Vince, but uh, see, after a while, it was like, well, I guess whatever I was to figure it in, I figured it was time to go. So I just did. I didn't really. Uh, well, when you're not figured in. That, I was called back in 93 to go to Atlanta for, uh, uh, I don't know, a legend thing with right. uh, rescuing myself. But uh, that was the only thing that I was ever called for. And uh, they were on the call events, and I should probably have done that at that time. But when you're not figured in and you got to go elsewhere, um, man, you've been married for what, 30 or 40 years? Yeah. Yeah, so. So. Right there, about 33 years. Okay, 33 years. Now, what was your wife's take on the business? Because, you know, I mean, you're always gone, you're always on the road. It's a life of a pro wrestler. And especially back in those days, with, with so much more driving than flying. Uh, and, and, you know, she was always there. I mean, but so she just accepted it. Hey, this is the way things work. And if we got to go, we got to go. And, or, or would you leave and just go places, uh, by yourself and then come home when you could? Yeah, that was about the way it was. I ended up just going like, uh, for Florida, go down there and just stay there till, uh, the next move, where I was back to Georgia, New York, or a trip to Japan or something. It really made it hard as far as any type of, family life or anything like that, because I can remember going years, you might as well say, without even being able to come home. Like, you go right through Christmas and that because they'd have shows and everything, and, or you're on a trip to Japan or something. It had to be real hard on the situation at home, but... Uh, There's not too many guys, Ivan, in the business that have marriages that lasted 33 years. Congratulations on that. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, that's true. Really? Yeah, that's only because it's hey, again. Hey, you had some uh, you had some interesting days on the road. I want to get to uh, uh, your life, uh, uh, your your things now that you're doing. Uh, now that you've uh, accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're an ordained minister. But I wanted to talk about some of the wilder times with uh, your time in the ring and on the road with Mad Dog Bus Sawyer. I was a big fan of the Mad Dog. Uh, I was a kid growing up, 
And that guy would came yeah. out, come out there on TV, and you think, oh, man, this guy really is crazy. He is the mad dog. But yeah. out of the ring and away from the ring, he, he was indeed a wild man. And uh, you ended up uh, kind of, uh, I don't know where you started, where you started off with beer and graduated to other things. But uh, I would imagine that when you were growing up on a farm in Canada, you'd never been exposed to a lot of alcohol and drugs. All of a sudden, you're in the wrestling business. You're right in the middle of it. You're a big star. You're in demand, and you're traveling. And you've got all the stress and all the downtime and the atmosphere. Uh, what, what was your foray into the drug scene? Because you got off into a pretty bad way. Sure did. Yeah, I ended up uh, with the injuries, of course, uh, being put on uh, painkillers, uh, stuff to relax, uh, sleeping pills and all this stuff. And uh, I think that that was in the early 70s whenever I got hurt real bad in the back. And uh, by the time the late 70s come, uh, I graduated, of course, at home. When I was a kid, just to back up there, it was, uh, you know, you worked hard. It was on the farm and you yeah. milked cows and by hand, you got the crop in and you did the whole thing. And, you, you know, once in a while, they'd have a little party and, if you were uh, even a teenager or uh, even younger than that, you were expected to work like a man, so you'd have to get together. and you, know, you were allowed to have a couple beers or a few beers and at home, and uh, the party, they always had a fiddle player in or something, and the music going well. But that only happened like once a year or something, usually during the harvest time, after the harvest time. But uh, so I, I, I knew that that wasn't something that uh, should be doing all the time. But as a, a wrestler... I ended up uh, right from the very start, like even uh, the wrestling school and all this stuff, I ended up uh, getting involved in it. And, uh, matter of fact, as a, a teenager getting into trouble with the law and all of this, because I tried to create my own business, I thought I was uh, back in the Old West, I guess. I ended up doing some stuff illegal that was uh, uh, cattle rustling, they called it. And uh, as I was put, uh, instead of having a truck or doing it the old, old way with uh, uh, horseback and uh, rope, but we'd end up roping them all right, my younger brother and I, but we'd pull them to the car, or twist their tail, get them in the car. <laughs> we'd end up taking a half a dozen of those uh, cattle to the, the sale and selling them until we got caught about six months later. And as a kid, uh, 17, just going on 18 years old, get caught with that, it was treated as a, you know, a felony and uh, ended up going to prison for a while for that. How much that prison was, time uh, did you do? Uh, it was actually a six-month sentence, but I did uh, uh, just about five months with good behavior and all that stuff. This is the Steve Austin Show. The wait is finally over. Football is in full swing. The NBA Finals are here, and MLB playoffs are heating up. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coaching props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. You can get in on season opening bonuses today and start off wagering on win, division, and championship futures today. Head to Bet Online today and take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. Okay, now you're a kid growing up on a farm. All of a sudden, you're in prison. Was that your, uh, was that a wake up call for you as far as a life of crime? And not not considering oh, yeah. the drugs you're about to get into, but as yeah. as a as a, hey man, this is not for me. Jail is not for yeah. me. No, that's right. Yeah, it definitely was. I, I really was scared to there to say the very very least. Is you got two thousand inmates and they go in gangs and everything and they going around uh, stealing stuff, taking stuff off you by force and all that. Uh, my, younger, my brother with me, and uh, we had to stand up for each other for, uh, sometimes. I tell a couple of stories in my book and that, but uh, and it was uh, definitely scary. So after that, uh, every time I got, I'd start drinking too much or get into any type of trouble, it like was trouble. I'd, uh, it cooled me off pretty quick because I was, uh, you know, what had happened before, but uh, I ended up, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of wild kids, like a lot of kids are whenever they get in teenager. Yes. Uh, like we'd uh, go down to the, have a few beers, my older brothers and I would get together. And uh, I can recall one time coming out of a bar and I was 
going to the wrestling school, and uh, my older brother Roger with me, and he was good with his fists, you know, and he uh, ended up this tall guy, about seven foot tall, was giving us a hard time outside the club. And I'd never seen anything like that in my life. My brother did a combination boxing move on him and hit that big guy with an uppercut, and he went bent right back with the guy, knocked him out cold. And it was situations like that it happened three or four times that got me edge into the wild, crazy stuff, you know, fighting bars and all that. But I never was a fighter or anything like that. I ended up, uh, you know, getting in situations like that to, there was no enough anyway that I shouldn't be doing that. But whenever I was out wrestling later on, and I graduated from drinking the beer to whiskey and I get into the pain pillow and then get into the marijuana and the other stuff like uh, uh, upwards and downwards and cocaine. And then, uh, man, it just got so bad that after a while, I, I was even uh, wrestling under the situations like that. But I guess I was... I uh, dedicated enough going to the gym that I sweated a lot of it out. So I was able to still... But I, have it, I heard you had like a $1,600 a week cocaine habit. Man, that's a lot of money for today, yesterday, $1,600 a week. Uh, where were you finding this stuff? I'm, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's everywhere we go. I mean, because there's always that element around the business. Uh, yeah. To me... Were you a light switch? Did you need something to take you uh, to make you go to sleep, and then something to get you up? Because it sounds like you were in a pretty bad place. Yeah, it it was like that, but uh, not realizing it at the time. It was uh, you know felt better like that, so you just go back to doing that. You know, the right. pain, or the uppers and downers of that. Uh, I could function at it. I, I remember getting up and smoking marijuana and put my uh, running stuff on and go run uh, three miles. You know. Come back and grab the the crow bomb and I'm in the pool, be some curls and some leg raises. I like work out like a maniac, you know. Stuff. Uh, if I did go to the gym, I'd work out like that. And uh, after a while, it just becomes routine. I and know. You get yeah. More, more involved. I always tell yeah. people a lot. Of, a lot of people, you know, back. I I, I never really had any uh, cocaine issues. I was more of a drinking guy, and I didn't yeah. really mess with too many pain pills. I needed something to go to sleep, but. But I was kind of like an, uh, a light switch. I needed something to uh, make me go to sleep. I needed something to get up in the morning, and that was usually a couple of Vicodin and some coffee and a couple of pots yeah. of coffee. And I always tell people, you get into zombie mode. And so what, what becomes normal for us is not normal to anybody else, and it's really not normal. It shouldn't be normal for us, but that's the way we operate. And, but, you know, when I, when I go back and I look at so many of your old matches because I just followed your career for so long because I just loved your work inside the ring and lo loved the whole gimmick, there was no way that I would ever look at Ivan Koloff on a television screen and say, oh, this dude's out of his mind on cocaine or he's pilled up because you always looked like you were in control and completely normal. Yeah, as it seemed like, yeah. I, I, I could see that people looking at it that way because that's the character I ended up becoming, I guess, you know, and... Uh, it became like a real thing rather than just uh, a persona or a gimmick type of thing. It was like uh, talking about Buzz Sawyer. We came in, uh, we'd go one week in Atlanta, one week in Ohio, so we'd fly to Ohio, rent a car, uh, do the, uh, the show there, wherever in Cincinnati, I'd drive to Cleveland, I'd do the show. I'd have to get back uh, to uh, Cincinnati or whatever to get the flight back to Atlanta for Saturday morning TV. And uh, you have to drive like uh, 200 some miles back from Cleveland to sit there, whatever, whatever it was. And we got in real late, different situations. Matter of fact, one situation, one time was the police with the helicopter came and pulled us over on the highway. Uh, a girl that uh, Bud had picked up in the, on the highway, or down in the highway on the matches, and was, she was in the car with us. She had called her sister, and her sister called the cops and said, we won't let her out of the car. And that wasn't the case at all. <laughs> let her out of the car. <laughs> when they came down and landed on the highway and stopped us, and they searched us all and all this stuff, and of course they found stuff in her. Uh, they let us go because they realized that the girl, she fessed up and said, no, no, my sister's crazy. She ended up calling it in. So they, they didn't let us go on that, but that was the situation, situation to, uh, one time that happened. Another time we ended up showing up late uh, for the TV and uh, only wanting to uh, uh, find us. She was a, 
the booker there yeah. in Atlanta at the time for Jim Barnett, and <laughs> he was going to find us. And I remember he fined Bud, uh, Buzz uh, $500 for being late uh, for TV. And then he was going to uh, uh, find me, and I was next. And I, I just I don't know, I said, no, well, he, I put my sweater off. I had a big hockey sweater. And I said, no, you're going to have to fight me for it. Only I, I knew Oli was a tough guy too, so I said, and, uh, you, and I'm going to take my money with me. You're not going to take my money because you're stealing it right out of my pocket and my family needs it. That's what I told him. Yeah. He just stared at me for about 30 seconds and he said, put your coat back on, Ivan. I said, sorry, I'll, I'll hook it up, I'll fix it up. He did. When I left the dinner drawer, I guess he had taken a couple hundred dollars off me without me knowing it. But he put, put it back on my check on my left because he knew I worked real hard, but uh, it, yeah, things got so bad, uh, you know, Steve, that I ended up, like, uh, going to the Middle East after wrestling back on. And even when I was wrestling back on, my knee was locking up in the ring. That's why when I came back from uh, uh, the Middle East, we went over there, a bunch of us, Iron Cheek and uh, Larry Henning's son, Kurt Henning, and a bunch of guys on the play, Fuji. And I ended up uh, drinking my vodka to play, go crazy, and... Uh, fight with the iron cheek on the plate and he bit me on the <laughs> on the deck you know now this is a shoot fight on a commercial airliner yeah so uh, what are the flight attendants crazy. doing panicking panic. when we landed in jordan before kuwait uh, the militia came on with machine guns on the plate oh, and no. Fuji had me tied in the seat by this time and every time i'd uh, come to and uh, went to go after the sheik again he pulled the seat cut tighter and I had about a 30-inch waist there for one trip anyway. <laughs> for, uh, but he was doing it for my, you know, my own sake, keeping me. Now, how salty was the Iron Sheik? I seen him at Buzzwatt one day in the motel room. Matter of fact, I refereed the match. I always get caught doing being the referee in street fights and all that. But he ended up, uh, they wanted to see who was better. And we were in the motel room. And they ended up with pushing furniture back. And they went for about... 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Who did? Wrestling. Amateur, you know. See who could pin who. And I was the referee. Was who was going the back and forth? Yeah, both of them were going back and forth. One to get one for a while. I'd go over to try to get him. And that was like, uh, they're having a real, they, they should have had tickets for that. I mean, I should have had to pay a ticket for that because, uh, I mean, they wrecked the place. TV was knocked over. And that was just one of the situations that, but another situation with Buds was we stopped at the store after a match up in Ohio, and uh, we ended up going in for some beer. And I was ahead of him, had some pretzels and whatever, and I ended up going out of the uh, store carrying a bag, and uh, Buds was behind me. This guy had been to the matches and was out in the, in the parking lot, and they ended up uh, saying to me as I came out the door, Street fight. You guys don't have a street fight. I can show you how to street fight. And I said, oh, is that right? So I went to put the bag down, but I was watching the guy real close that he didn't kick me or something while I was putting the bag down. I was going to see how he could street fight. So I was crazy myself. So ended up, uh, as I put the bag down, when I turned to face the guy, Buzz came out like a bulldozer, knocked the guy out to the, the parking lot, I picked that guy up, no kid. He was like a rag doll, that guy. Buzz was picking him up, slamming him, suplexing him. And uh, the cop came around, uh, jumped out of the car, and had the gun on Buzz. And uh, Buzz had had him up in, I don't know, bear hug or something. Squeezed, uh, squeezed him anyway. The guy was screaming. And uh, <laughs> the cop said, drop that man. And uh, <laughs> Buzz dropped him. And he, he said, get your hands up, and all this stuff. And it was just like, Something you'd see on TV or something, you know, but it was for real. This guy was panicking to get out of there because Buzz, Buzz was killing him. So Buzz could fight. He was <laughs> the scrapper for sure. And, uh, so these but all the boys were kind of, it, it was kind of like the Wild Wild West back then, right? It was. Oh, yeah. I mean, you literally had to fight, fight for your spot on the card. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, talk about a street fight. I uh, see Brian and... Uh, Matt had bored at it one day, and I was the referee in that, raising the bar. Went right outside, I kept refereeing it. They'd go for the eyes or something, I'd kick that. No, no eyes, no hair. <laughs> they came out of that all bloody, tore up. And, oh, man. This 
This is the Steve Austin Show. How do you banish high rates on your car insurance? You switch to GEICO during geico Ween. October is our favorite time of the year, and the folks over at GEICO have been working even harder to cast out high rates and craft just the right policy for you and your family. Switching to GEICO isn't so scary, especially when they could brew up spellbinding savings just for you. So get a quote today at GEICO.com and see just how much you could save. No eye of the newt needed. Happy Geico Ween, everybody. How was being in the ring with Andre the Giant? How strong was that guy? How and how did you get along with him? I got along real good. He really liked me. Uh, uh, I guess because uh, I, I went in there with uh, trying to do the right thing. I was intimidated first of all. You know, there was a giant and figure you turn around. But the first time I got in there, I was after I won the belt. You know, up there in, in Mont- uh, Montreal, and I figured, well, I'm three hundred pounds and you know, I do 500 pounds. But anyway, you start feeling, you know, try to reason this out. <laughs> Giant backed me in the corner, and I realized how big this guy was. I couldn't even see over his shoulder, like, you know, his head was still up there. He had me back to the corner, and he was, you know, with his back towards me, and he was just doing that thing where he grabs the rope. And it felt like every time he'd crunch backwards, the rope would hit me in the side, and the ribs, and the back. It felt like it was, something was going to break. So I was saying uh, I was going, ah, ah. He, he was laughing. Oh, oh, oh. Like, he was, uh, uh, oh, yeah. Then after the match, I said to him, I said, Andre, did you drink beer? He says, uh, yes. And I said, uh, tonight I buy you the beer, okay? He liked that, that I was uh, willing to buy him some beer, you know. So he never hurt me in the uh, ring. And uh, yeah, I always liked to go back in the ring and, and wrestle. Matter of fact, one time we had, they had to come back from Florida to wrestled him in the Coliseum in Montreal, and uh, we even did a thing where uh, Audrey suggested it, too, where he was at the table going to sign the contract, I picked up a chair and hit him over the head, and he went down. To, I was surprised. He went down and everything. Came up, blood all over the place. And, I mean, that really made the match right there. Like, you know, to set it up for Cello for sure. But he was really nice. But you didn't want to mess with him in the rain because, you know, he could hurt you. Could he literally uh, do anything man. he wanted because he was so strong? Yeah. He could, so big, so strong. And, I mean, it could anything with me anyway. I guess there is some guys out there that know a lot of wrestling and the tough guys, you know, that probably could do something with them maybe, but uh, I just sure didn't want to try. Hey, Ivan, you mentioned getting color when uh, you hit Andre with that chair. I, I noticed, you know, when I, want, when I look at you, uh, in regards to you getting color, you seem to make a vertical cut rather than a horizontal. Why was this? I found it, uh, you know, for a long time there, I would end up, uh, because it seemed like they wanted, uh, you know, the situation every night. And, you know, whatever I'd angle here with the Jimmy Valiant, the boogeyman, and the rope warriors or whatever, you'd end up uh, one night uh, uh, bleeding and the next night, uh, you know, because you're wrestling every night, every night, every night, seven days a week. And the, the guy would just hit the same cut. Well, after I got staph infection in my head for <laughs> one time there, I was a little leery of that, but. For a long time, that's what I was doing, just opening up the same cut. But uh, I think the, the reason uh, for a while there was I carried it on my wrist, and then later on I carried my mouth. So in my mouth, it was easier to go, I guess, uh, horizontal or whatever. <laughs> but for a long time, man, that's what I was trying to do. I was uh, figuring that uh, would make the matches look better. I remember one match with Bruno, the cage. I hit that cage uh, 20 times if I didn't hit it. 40 times, and never did get uh, any juice. I hit it hard. I hit it as hard as I could. <laughs> I did that key. He told me in the case, I just hit it as hard as I could with my head. And uh, next day I got up, I had scrapes all over, burns all over, and uh, so bruises, you was, but no, You were no trying juice. to hardware yourself? Yeah, that's right. That's how crazy you know. figured to be a good, you know, hardware. Hey, Ivan, going back to your first blade job, you know, when I went to pro wrestling school, I was taught by a man named Gentleman Chris Adams. They didn't teach me how to swing a steel chair. They didn't teach me how to make my own blade. It's some of those things that you learn from someone that passes it on to you. With regard to making your own blade, who was the guy? Because you don't just start making a blade uh, because you don't know how to make one. Who taught you how to make a blade? That'd be the guys in the gym. 
Yeah, there was uh, some guys that were already training there in the gym. So the guys like Johnny, well, Johnny Powers wasn't there then. He had right. already been trained and left the gym. But there was uh, some old timers there. Senator, uh, Senator Clark, uh, let me see, I'm trying to think. The Love Brothers were going to the gym then. But you'd like to carry on your wrist? Yeah, they had me. But they, they just had me had, had it at the wrist and the time came because they had matches at that gym every Thursday night. Uh, outside, and then I go under the ring, right, to get it and yeah. do it. I mean, <laughs> that was the first time. That was scary. I mean, I don't know what you do, nervous and everything, but what you did at one time, and then you were used to it. But it got, it got better as time went on. Uh, at first, I carried on the wrist and that, and then uh, later on, it wasn't long after I started carrying them out, because I figured it was uh, a lot easier to get to, you know. A lot of guys thought, you're crazy carrying your mouth. You want to swallow it, you know, but Never did swallow it. And, you know, uh, uh, Brett the Hitman Hart uh, carried one in his mouth as well. And you never had no issues with that? No, never did. Uh, I might have uh, nicked myself a little bit a time or two, but uh, I, nothing I can recall not a swallowing or anything like that, you know. I just, uh, I really enjoyed your tag your tag team uh, combination of, of you and Nikita. And there were so many great tag teams back in the day with, you know, the Russians and, and also... Uh, Barry Darso would, would team with you on many occasions as well. But you had the Rock and Roll Express, the Midnight Express. You had the Road Warriors. You had Arn and Oli or Arn and Tully or, uh, and many more. What happened to tag team wrestling? Because it's hard to beat a great tag team match when it's on the card. Because especially when you have two bona fide teams and four guys that can work their ass off, uh, and a great referee, uh, and I, I was watching some of your old matches. Tommy Young was a referee in a lot of those matches. I really loved his work. But what has happened to tag team wrestling in your estimation? Why did it disappear? Yeah, I think a lot of it was uh, people uh, back in the, those days of uh, wrestling was uh, educated more to the tag team. It, it seemed like it was made more uh, on the interviews and uh they kept up to it, the, the fan, the, what happened each uh, week, and it seemed like it was a continual uh, build-up thing because we were talking about it every week. And it seemed like every town you'd have a little bit different uh, thing going on that, so that some of the fans, as they traveled, they weren't up to it. It was still related to the same guy, you know, the, the feud, but uh, maybe a different type of match. And it seemed like, I don't know, it really... Uh, gotten away from that or maybe more time was spent at it just to get that uh, real heat going, I guess. Or, uh, you know, nowadays it's hard to get that heat because of, you know, wrestling being out in the open more with the fan. And I guess the fans realize that well, these guys are just in there playing around, you know. Right. But they're not really playing around. That's what I try to tell them. Can you imagine going around playing around and getting dislocated shoulders, and, you know, <laughs> A busted neck and yeah, whatever. I think it's more of a pre how it's presented these days versus what it was in the old days. I mean, you know, the, back in the old days, I mean, you know, wrestling was still quote unquote real. All of the exposés hadn't happened, and you know, I, I understand that today's uh, everything changes, but it's all in how it's presented. I wanted yeah. to talk before before we hit the go home on this. Talk about your association with Nikita Koloff because. Whose idea was it to put you two guys together? Because it would later on down the road many years be Nikita Koloff make an introduction to you uh, with someone who would basically turn your life around. So whose idea was it to put you and Nikita together as a tag team in the ring? The first time I heard anything about it was uh, Jim Cockett came up to me and he said, uh, uh, I've excelled not only in uh, uh, singles before, but in uh, tag team also. Uh, how about if you got a partner, maybe like a nephew or something like that, so it would be close to you that uh, you create like a team together. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm all for it. Uh, who who do you got mine? I had nobody in mind, so went picking our brain, you know. Of course, I didn't have no relative. I had a son, but he did take up wrestling. So uh, I said, who could it be? And uh, Animal got into it, uh, the Road Warriors, and he came up with Nikita because he grew up with him in Minnesota. And Nikita was a football player, collegiate, and uh, I think with uh, Omaha, if I'm not mistaken, and South, uh, South, South Dakota. Anyway, he was a pretty good football player, I guess, and worked out at the gym with uh, Animal and Hawk for a while there. 
come it up. And I guess Crusher was even part of that group up there too, Crusher Christian, yep. Barry Darso. And they ended up anyway picking the key to it. And when I see them for the first time, they brought him down right away and got started with it. I said, man, this guy should be ideal. He's a college graduate. Uh, he's on the ball as far as education. You know, he looks great. You know, he's close to 300-pounder, obviously working out like a bodybuilder. And uh, put him on the right road. You should be able to develop some. And I pretty well thought of it the same way as what happened to me. Like, you know, let the, somebody else do the talk and stand there intimidating looking and uh, just be very convincing in the ring. And that's what I was told uh, is starting off. And but the kids did it perfect. And with him, of course, he never went to a wrestling school. So he, uh, even though he's an athlete, we had to teach him things each day from Don Cardoodle helping him, myself. And, uh, you know, I guess a lot of the guys put their information in. But I try to sit down with him each day and, and uh, go over uh, one thing, at least in the dressing room. Standard wrist lock, uh, backdrop, uh, you know, slam or whatever it is, it's the way you do it and all that. He pick up real quick. I said, now, whenever you're in public, uh, don't be talking to the people, don't with the accent and all the way. And lay them in. Don't be afraid to lay it in when you're in the ring. Like, right. You know, you got to make it look good in the ring because they're going to only believe what they see, you know. And if, and if you're not uh, experienced at it, you're going to probably could be going to be able to see to it unless you're real solid. He was solid, all right. <laughs> he had more people, <laughs> more of the boys complained, even myself. As he came, i tag him, he'd come into the, it's a great part of the ring, and me to come in, and that elbow of his would catch me, and, oh, it's, oh, man. And then <laughs> he'd slot my hand like for a tag, and I'd be like six out of my hand. But I'd do it, uh, uh, you know, not only for the people, but I was doing it. But the idea that he slapped it hard. I even said to him in the dressing room, I said, Nicky, I'm your partner now. <laughs> you're not supposed to kill me. You're supposed to kill the opponent. Yeah. Now, of course, I was kidding with him, you know, but yeah. you get across to him that he was being solid, and that's what we wanted. And he knocked hit the guy sometime with that sickle clothesline, and the guy do a, a whole backflip, like a, I guess, a one and a half. Yeah. And uh, when I see one of the monkeys do that, I said, oh, my. <laughs> you must have heard it, but the bulk is, I guess, just went with it, I guess, the, the, the force of it knocked him over. But, yeah, Nicky was real good like that, catching on to stuff and keeping the accent when he was out there. And it paid off because uh, they really believed in you could do it. Because uh, we had that big memorial show at Memorial Park there in Charlotte for over 30,000 people. And Flair flew in on the helicopter that night. Man, I could tell by the, the crowd that they wanted to see something there. Was Flair against Dikita, and, and uh, I think we were against uh, Rogue Warriors and the Crusher, and uh, and that was uh, good. Of course, four horsemen around there too, Dusty and all them. So they had a good card for sure. But they, they really uh, could tell the people were riot. Whenever somebody runs in the ring, tries to get Dikita before the match even starts, you know that they're <laughs> really hot at it. You just named a lot Nikita of big names there. Uh, in you? my life, but, you know, and I think it was God. Ordained, he, well, let's put the keys in there, knowing that I'd, I'd need to have some help, somebody with some credibility with me to, to reach me. Because after I quit in 89, the, the keys are new from 83 to 89, like, you know, six, five, six years being together, that, uh, you know, I had a little trouble with the drugs and the alcohol. And matter of fact, I quit with the idea of really settling down, trying to get off of this stuff and clean up my situation here. And, Make the wrestle better, uh, you know, heal up a bit. But I ended up uh, throwing the stuff away and going back to it, throwing away and going back to it. Uh, I even had a wrestling school for a while there, for four or five years. And, uh, after that, I just get to the point that uh, I just keep going back to it. So, I, I, of course, I couldn't afford cocaine anymore, so I was able to get out of that. But uh ended up, uh, Nikita called me one day, and he said to me on the phone, you got my attention, he was, he said uh, he wanted to invite me to come to the church that he had become a born again Christian. And he said, uh, you, you, I know what you need in your life, Uncle. You need uh, Jesus in your life. And I said, What are you talking about, Nicky? I was raised in the Catholic Church. I went to church every week, and I know who Jesus is. He said, It's not that. He said, The devil knows who Jesus is, too, but that doesn't make him a Christian. So he got my attention. I said, oh. So I ended up going to that church, but. By looking for that help, you know, I needed to get off the drugs. And 
uh, I got it all right because uh, this little Catholic boy found himself uh, on his butt <laughs> when, I, when the service was over because the Lord touched me in such a way I ended up being overtaken by the spirits is, is the way I understand it. And I mean, I went down the fastest I've ever done in my life. I thought maybe it was uh, somebody like uh, Andre the Giant uh, clotheslined me, but uh, it was so gentle. Uh, when I landed, I just hurt myself or nothing. And, and I was like down, and I felt real good. And I went to jump up because wrestling were taught, I guess, I have it. And the key to grab me, and he says, uh, relax, that's the Holy Spirit. And man, I, I realized it had to be God because I had no way I went down in front of all those people, you know, like that. I even said that to myself, seeing people before go down and said it must be that they're paid to do that or something. They're, what they're saying is by me receiving Christ, uh, my old debt was paid, uh, all that crazy stuff I did, uh, I was forgiven of it, and uh, anything I do in the future, he, if I keep him as my uh, tight team partner, more or less to say, that uh, I'd be able to uh, overcome anything, and he'd never leave me or forsake me. It wasn't an immediate cure for your addiction, though. So how did you no. how did you stay with the process to, uh, I would imagine you're 100% clean right, right now, correct? Yes, sir. Yep. But sure. So how long did it take uh, you because the, the cocaine, you got rid of that, then you started leaning mm -hmm. on the marijuana, you started going to the chewing tobacco, that's not illegal, but you, you, needed, you needed a crutch. And yep. so what was the weaning off process for you? Did you do it yourself? Did you go to a drug rehab place? No, re uh, no drug rehab. No, and that's what's really surprising about the whole thing. I know that some people went right from receiving Christ to quit smoking and all, doing it, all the other stuff. With me, it was a process. I was told it was important to get into the Word, that by taking into the Word of God, the Bible, and reading it, I end up taking in the Word, and it pushes out all the other junk. And what happens is, over a period of time, your faith grows to the period that God blesses you enough to be able to quit this stuff. So it gives you the strength to be able to quit it. So what happened with me was the tune to back went real quick. And uh, I must say, I was fighting a bit there for a while with the, the, the beer and that, but uh, it wasn't long, just a few months type thing, and everything went away because I said, for myself, and I believed the fact of what they, they had told me, and I just went with that and uh, kept asking God for help. And uh, man, I just started throwing this stuff away. The, the marijuana and that the, just went one day, just like I don't want it no more. The cocaine I wasn't involved in with anymore. And that was different than what I was doing just a year before that or six months before that. I was you know, throwing it away, but I was going back and taking it back, and now I wasn't doing that. So I figured that. Uh, God was uh, working in my my life and let, let me have the strength to be able to overcome this. So it's pretty hard to deny him then whenever you start getting this kind of help, you know. So now you're an ordained minister. And yes, you do a lot of work with the Children's Miracle Network. Yeah, I just did one step last night. If I run out of a place to go, I'll go in any place. And whether it's a food store or Walmart, uh, Kmart, <laughs> whatever, they've all allowed me in. At uh, one time or another, and and the people really respond good because they just end up doing some good cause and they're uh, doing it for a good reason, and uh, and they're really uh, kind about it. And uh, the stores all do campaigns like that for to raise money for these good causes, and I'm all for it. It keeps me occupied, busy, and feel like you're somewhat worthy of to doing something because you went through this career of being noticed, and now all of a sudden. You stuck it at home. What are you gonna do? You coach the painter, or potato, or get out there and uh, you know do something useful. And I feel like by getting out and you know talking to kids and encouraging kids because you don't know how much that touches kids. Well, you probably do yourself. So go, you know, Steve, because you uh, you know been a big star too. And whatever you tell a kid, uh, man, I, I believe someday you're gonna be a famous guy. You know, you're a great athlete, aren't you? Of what that you instill in that kid, he's going to take that home, and he's going to end up, you know, thinking of that and reacting to that uh, time and time again over his lifetime. Because that's what my mom said to me too when I came home and told her I want to be a wrestler at eight years old. She says, "You can do it." Every, every time she sees me, she says, "There's my little champ. He's going to be a wrestling champ one day." 
And that always stuck with me. So now I try to talk to other kids, you know, try to tell them, uh, find out what they're interested in. And tell them, you can do it. You can do it. I'll be looking for you, you know. And uh, that, uh, I think, it really instill kids and helps them to dream, you know. Ivan, mean, you have your website, IvanKoloff.com, and you're on Twitter, I Koloff. Uh, you got anything coming up that you want to plug? Anything uh, else that you want to talk about? Yeah, I ended up, uh, you know, fans being so nice and different people uh, pulling together for, uh, they just did a, matter of fact, coming out in uh, January, I believe he said the documentary would be ready that a lot of fans had a part in, uh, not only raising money to put the documentary together to uh, a, a friend, uh, Mike, uh, Michael Elliott, uh, in the, the Charlotte area, but he's going to be coming out in January with that. I'll have it on my site, and he'll have it on his site, too, Elbow, uh, Elbow Press, I think is his uh, name of his uh, company type thing. And uh, also, they can go to uh, my author of my book that you mentioned earlier, uh, Is That Wrestling Fake? The Bare Facts by Ivan Kola. Uh, Scott Teal is the author. He's done several books on different guys at... Uh, his is crowbarpress.com, and uh, I've got Facebooks and all that stuff. But uh, and my daughter is a gospel singer, and she is great. Uh, she's got the, her baby singing with her sometimes. Uh, their group is called uh, Highway Revival. Of course, my book is uh, crowbarpress.com, and uh, check out my site if you would, uh, folks. Uh, it's ivankolov.com, and uh, got my. Uh, different stuff on there from pictures and all that and uh, uh, it really helps if you feel like you'd like to donate to my ministry just go to uh, ivankolov.com and uh, PayPal is hooked up to that or just send it to my address there and there. It, it would be a big help. Uh, I really appreciate you folks over the years, man, and look forward to hearing this uh, and play back to you. Ivan, is, uh, it was good talking to you. I'm a big fan of your work and uh, glad to hear you're, you're doing good. And uh, we'll see one of these days about getting that hip fixed, kid. Yeah, my, my big thing now is I want to see Vince uh, use me in the Hall of Fame there. I want to get that say hello to my, all my friends before I hang it up here. <laughs> okay. No, I'm still good for a few miles yet, but I guess I wouldn't be good in the ring, but uh, unless I had an awful weak opponent, but. Uh, I was trying to get a hold of the office up there, you know, Steve, because I had a suggestion for the Russian guy. I really think they put a lot of stuff on him, a lot of heat on it. But uh, I can't get nobody to call me back. There's been several Russians throughout the history of our uh, illustrious business of professional wrestling, which they now call sports entertainment. What are your thoughts on the sports entertainment? Yeah, I, I really like it. Uh, the idea that uh, now they're able to do something, I, I really thought at first it was... Uh, they're making a big mistake at, at uh, having, uh, you know, more or less go show business with it, like uh, out there to the people. But I really think that uh, Vince has got something there. It's just the idea of keeping the interest up. Everybody could be critical of stuff and find fault with it. But to me, whenever you got guys that uh, athletes like these got out there doing the stuff they're doing today, man, the target uh, guys that take great shape and uh, work so hard, you know, and, Gotta be getting hurt. What do you like about this Rusev kid? Yeah, I think he's good. I think he's a good uh, sized guy, and uh, uh, I like the stuff he does, man. He's able to kick the guy right in the face. Definitely. Yep, he's good. And, uh, I think the girl adds a lot to him. I think he's very aggressive, uh, powerful. Uh, he's not trying yeah. to say too much on his promos, they're very simple. Uh, I like the kid a lot. He's, he's still got a long ways to go. He's relatively green, but I think he's going to be a big star. Yeah, he I'd like to suggest something for him up there that uh, I think would uh, work good as a finishing thing for him. And, uh, I think he's got to talk to the right guys, you know, about you know, introducing him. Well, if anybody would know, it would be you who had uh, tremendous success as a Russian coming from Canada. But I'll pass along the thought that you're trying to reach out to him, and we'll see if we can hook you guys up. Yeah, I think uh, uh, just, I just want them to listen if they say no good. But fine, but I don't want to just talk to anybody up there, you know. I wanted to talk to somebody that, you know, that hit the business and that thing. Well, all right, Ivan, I appreciate your time. It was great talking to you. You too, Steve. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. This 
was coming. Guess who? Let me start this thing off. Join me every week for the Michael Irvin Podcast. We'll give you the full MIP experience. I'm talking everything from football to fashion. I will be chopping it up with playmakers, headline makers, and I am throwing haymakers. I'm the MVP of the MIP. Don't miss it. Download new episodes of the MIP, the Michael Irvin Podcast, every Thursday on Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, and Spotify. Why is the new Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed your answer to better health and wellness? It's proven quality sleep. Any more questions? Yes, I'm always freezing, and he overheats. It's temperature balancing, so you can sleep better together. But can it help keep us asleep? It senses your movements. 